Today's session is in the file from design to code, scaling design with collaboration and documentation. I'm very excited. I haven't seen too much of the presentation, but I know that the Wix team have been doing some awesome, awesome work. And I can't wait to see what they've been up to. Today's speaker is Domas. He is the UX lead at Wix.com. He's a great guy, he's really talented. He's also an expert at Figma. And I can't wait to see what he's up to. So I'm gonna hand over to Domas to get started. Please feel free to go and share your screen. All right, so, okay, before I share my screen, let me get, just introduce myself uh, a little bit more. So I work at Wix already for six years and I'm based in Vilnius, Lithuania. Uh, this is where I'm streaming this from. And yeah, I'll be talking mostly about the handoff, uh, our work files to developers. So let me share a screen. This is really nice, uh, by the way. Like it, it helped me out to uh, test some um, uh, unexpected things. Just because, like, once I clicked to take a photo, it crashed my Figma. So I'm really glad that it happened before starting this presentation, <laughs> not now. Um, so okay. So what we agreed on today to to speak about is mainly three things: uh, collaboration nuances about when we start from a small team and then scale to a large team. Unfortunately, my colleague couldn't join me, so I'll be touching only on the high level at this point today, but I promise I will touch on the product side and then show how different teams work at Wix uh, because everyone is individual uh, in our company. Another thing is uh, important aspect that how we communicate um, to the teams about the changes in design systems uh, and about the breaking changes that we make in the library and uh, how they have to deal with this. And the last thing is just uh, handing out the products to developers in two stages. First, once we de design a component in a library and the second thing, when we design a product and then we want, we want to launch a product. Uh, so this is just a brief agenda about it. So I don't have slides uh, specifically for today, but I have a bunch of files and then I have this, just a timeline. It's uh, oversimplified. It's it, more details in one area where I focus more and I think it's important for today. There are fewer and missing some steps. So please don't judge it uh, too hard. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it shouldn't be um, part of today's uh, uh, focus either way on that, but I just highlighted the points that matches our work together with Figma tool. And if I zoom out, so I'm not really sure how well uh, you can read the text, but I'll let me read it for you. I split it into two zones. So the first path is when a new component is born in a design system library. And then when we have this design system library, which is in the middle here, then the product teams takes these assets into their product and they, then they build their own product and they just do their user flows and then they do some handoff files, then follows the development, product QA launch and et cetera, right? Um, so let me start from the beginning. So we are here at the start. This is where I work. I work in design systems team. And my, um, my interaction together with the product teams usually happens at this stage that there is some kind of a reason to make a change in the library. So it's a, either it's a strategic move or it's a product need that, for example, product designs something and they say, hey, this library doesn't support this kind of a button. Or we just say that, we have way too many buttons, we just need to optimize it and then refactor the library and then just drop to some features, maybe rethink them different way. So what we usually do, um, we have like long process in between just to try to find the, the real solution. Um, but the, the outcome itself is communicated in the uh, design specs. This is how we call it, but like it's a specification file explaining how the component should look like, and then it should be clear to read for developers. So this is the, the, the main uh, outcome. So what I'm going to share today, I'm going to share what we 
have already. Most of the files, I must say, they were imported from Sketch. This is where we used to work in the past. So they might, um, they, they show like this one. It's, um, I'll, I'll explain what this is, it, what it is. Um, but uh, it shares a lot of information, but it's built not using any of uh, Figma features. While the next example, it will show, you know, how we um, adjusted this one and the future changes right now actually are reflected with all the Figma benefits. All right, so what, what this file contains, um, it's a component that it's a atomic um, item. This is like what we used to call uh, IC, which is called the uh, internal component. It's not meant for the end user, but it's usually used for building other components such as table lists and also nestable list, which allows to drag and drop and nest items uh, within itself. Just on these components here, I noticed on the introductory page, you had table list as one word. Um, I think it was using camel casing or Pascal casing or something um, yeah. on the intro page. Is that the naming convention that you use for all your components? Yes, so yeah, so this like, I, I see it even doesn't have any spaces. So we just decided to, it's, it's very interesting. Um, and then maybe I can even tell how one of the Figma features helped uh, out at least for us to get rid of uh, um, our past workflow. So in the past, we used to index all of our components. So 1.2, 1.7, for example, the first number means which family it belongs to, whether it's uh, form elements, table lists, um, buttons, etc. cetera. Um, and, and then we had the library um, of actual components. And then we have a mapping where you know, developers can go look and then find based on this index file. The downside of this indexing is that it's not intuitive. Like numbers, they don't mean anything you know, when we just read them. So somebody has to memorize it. And, and then we used some plugins, uh, some that you know, once you click it, so then you can inspect it. Also Zeppelin supports some solutions. We use that as well. Uh, but that you know came right just after we introduced this this uh, index file. Like we used it for a long time, and what we do right now. So I can just go back a little bit here and then show maybe an input file, which will have. Um... Wow, sorry, <laughs> I cannot click on this URL because both of these they are too close so um i'm sorry i have to do this um uh, I'm, I'm very sorry if we have graphic designers here that who are really uh picky about kerning and then uh bleeding uh leading uh but <laughs> yeah i just have to make the line height higher to click this so okay input it's uh it's also like you see on the left, it shares the old spec that was imported from Sketch. And then the right one is using a template that we built inside of uh, Figma. And then right now we are rebuilding. Um, sometimes once we need to update and introduce some new feature, so then we introduce this new feature in this new template. And then also we take some time to rebuild all the past examples, so just for story. So most of these examples, if I drill in, they contain the actual component, like uh, we don't detach it here. And if I go into the inspect mode, it should be that at the, still thinking at which level. Oh no, it is detached. Okay, so. Let me think. Okay, so no worries. I'll just, what I'm going to do. Um, yeah, this one, exactly. So how we share the information with developers right now, uh, instead of these index names, um, we do two things. First, uh, we use the area for the description to share the snippets of the actual code. 
And another thing is this uh, component URL is also very handful that once you click on it, it opens our documentation, which is public. Storybook. Oh, yeah. And it is broken. Mm -hmm. There is a reason, like we're fixing it. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go to the details why it is, but it was leading a while ago when it worked to here. Um, and then, yeah, a developer can just go into this and then read about all the properties that we share or just go into the API area and then read about the available properties. Great, I've got a few questions on this process. So the sure. input field where you paste the code snippet, who mm -hmm. main, who's responsible for updating that description field? Um, you mean that once we change the API or just- uh, When you're building components. Who oh, is the design generally. systems team specifically that adds the snippet, or is it an engineer who, who is uh, responsible for this? Yeah, so it, it is the designer who does this. Um, so we have some designers who cross discipline uh, professionals, I would call them like that. And so, you know, they feel comfortable with the code and also with the design, so they can do this job. Um, and uh, and the downside right now is just that it's all manual. So, you know, if we change the API, so we have manually to update it. And then we're still playing around. Like this is quite recent, I must say, because we migrated to um, the Figma platform and, and all the library migrated only this the, the last summer. So we're still in the experimenting mode. Um, so I'm jumping through many topics, but yeah, I, I can lead to another thing that uh, if we want to continue on this, what we learn about it, because we run a usability test with some developers just to understand how they interpreted it. The um, storybook library, is that a designer maintained or is it developer maintained? Both, yeah. So um, this is, yeah, where we contain basically all of our components um so it's primarily developer oriented but we just noticed across the time and usability testing that a bunch of and then through interviews that a lot of our designers just prefer to go there either way because they want to see the end result so then what we started doing like we started combining this one so it's still like for a long time, it was unmaintained because it was purely engineer for engineers and nobody cared uh, that much as, as, as of a representation object. But right now, as we take care of more of it, um, so the whole form uh, family, for example, it's, it's very well documented. And then we have a format for this that everything comes in the same structure and then we just have the rules how we define things. So every example, it talks about a specific property which is meant for developers. Uh, sometimes maybe it's even too simple for developers because it, it shows just in this example, it talks only about this small segment, um, but it, it makes it very clear to understand like uh, how it works. And, uh, and then, on the top of it, like what we add, we just add a very small uh, designer guide that where each parameter should be used. So usually it's valuable both for a designer and the developer because the designers, they're looking for these questions and developers usually as just a gatekeepers because developers who care about design, they usually say, hey, I read this you know, in our documentation and then you shouldn't do that. Uh, and then it backfires to designers as well, which is a win-win situation. Great, thank you. Uh, I, I know I derailed you a little bit there from the original file, so yeah. feel free to jump back. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so continuing on, um, on the inspect area, um, let me sure just share, share with you just two slides. Um, here in the later step where I added it just, I called it a holy bucket of components, which is just a design system library. Um, yeah, uh, so 
just recently, I think, yeah, it, just, it was just the last quarter. We were testing multiple things, but including also the Figma and understanding how, um, how developers manage uh, to, can I zoom it in? With uh, the slideshow top right. Maybe like this, yeah. So let's hope we see this. So the experiment was like this. It was a usability test that we gave this Figma file where were like very clear areas, this, this and this component. Then on the top, there were examples that, you know, what we expect from a developer to respond. And then we asked like, could you just identify, you know, what snippet should be inserted here and then here just to get the right result. And then we checked how they perform. So they performed, you know, they, they achieved their results in some or other way. But what we learned that everything that we, um, let's zoom it out again. Um, everything that we expected for this side snippet and then view documentation area that will be super beneficial for them, they didn't use it at all, at least these six people. Like why that happened, we don't know yet. Uh, probably because like this is a new tool, so they're not used to, to it. And all of them, they assumed it's meant for designers and but not for developers to view documentation. Uh, so it's part of a communication, I guess, and then just overall just involvement in, in our company. Um, and uh, and yeah, we learned some some things that uh, like as we saw that uh, we assumed that this will be the, the number one feature to help out to solve this. Apparently, it isn't, um, and it's it's not. It's I'm not you know phrasing it as, as a bad thing. I'm just trying to phrase it as a fact because in the end, like all products are still developed and then they're perform well. So it means that people still manage to achieve their things. I really liked how you basically done a small research program to analyze the handoff process and its effectiveness. That's a really nice approach. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so where I should talk next. So I guess looking at that, that situation there where we had a proposal by the design systems team um, and it didn't, mm -hmm. maybe didn't quite work out. Is this something you do frequently where you test ideas out between design development, the handoff process to understand its effectiveness? So, yeah, we do it not too often, but we try to do on some areas, uh, at least like once a quarter or at least once in a half a year. And sometimes like we don't have these recurring things that, okay, we're going to test this exact feature every quarter, let's say, but what we do instead that we usually we just uh, identify some pain points. And then just before right jumping into solving these pain points, we try to just zoom out a bit and then try to really understand the full context. Like um, maybe, you know, the cause is not what we assume, but there may be way more reasons. So then we usually take a slightly broader research, which includes this area, like in this example, and then we learn even new things that we were not aware of. What does the future look like for this particular stage of that handoff cycle that you have been testing? Oh, the, the future that we are future. working on? Oh, future. Yeah. Um, okay, so it's, uh, we're not planning to abandon this, uh, this, this, uh, URL button and then also description, I still believe like it's a, it's a great feature. It's uh, we're still trying to identify and then probably we'll test it again and check whether people get familiar with it. And then if it changes over time, so then we gather more data. And then in meanwhile, like during this usability test, we'll learn other things where we can act now. And then it's very clear, like what do we need to fix to improve. So it touches the storybook that we use, uh, other parts, and we're focusing on that part for now. With regards to the collaboration between design and development on the Figma side, do you mm -hmm. encourage people to invite developers into the files to, to inspect things and get the assets and that sort of thing out of the file, or is that handled slightly differently? I know you've got the storybook installation for components, 
how does that translate to things like user flows and even testing our design systems? Yeah, so so this is this depends uh, per team. So I can share a few files and then I think hopefully it, it, it will answer this question. Um, let me jump back a little bit to, to this file where I started at. So this is how we hand off design files for developers who are making new components. And then this all file, it's segmented. Like this is a very complex file, by the way. Uh, so sometimes like we have way smaller ones, but it, it, all of them, they share the same structure. At first, like we just share the main properties. It might be not all the properties that component have, but they are all related to layout and functional changes. For example, if allows to control number of columns, if allows to control the width of the columns and then what controllability would give, alignment of the columns uh, in this case, if it has a draggable or not feature, so then it, in this case, it enables this icon. And then once we scroll down, like we usually communicate if it's reusing some other components inside of it. So we just highlight uh, with these annotations. And the most important part is uh, this constraints area where we just showcase according like what parameter is turned on or off, how its layout changes. And this is like what we learned over time that highlighting with these zones that uh, I must say, um, I took it from Chrome and then, you know, once you inspect code in Chrome and then it highlights the areas, this format, it seemed to work best for developers to interpret uh, how component needs to build, needs to be built. Um, and then it, it takes the fewest steps in the QA uh, stage. So yeah, so this is like, this is how we work in, uh, in design systems team, but let's see, you know, how we work in uh, product teams. So once product teams, they take uh, our components, uh, I have two examples. Yeah, let's start with a simple one. And I split them into two stages that product flows and then the handoff. Um, but basically what I learned that teams, they, they usually contain both of these handoff and then flows in the same file. Uh, and then in this particular file, there is just a handoff because it's a very, very simple product, but it still shares some interesting stuff. Um, yeah, so in this one, the end result is just this settings page. Um, let me zoom it in a little bit. Yeah, um, let's just hide the side panels. Um, yeah, so you can see a better view. It has multiple cards and then controls in each card. So what forum team does and how they work and what I really like about this, um, they take our components and out of these components, they build their own blocks, usually the features that they repeat in the flows. Um, so they don't have to recreate them all the time. And they just have these small buckets of features where they usually align them with the UX writers, um, just finalize. Then they have this um, one, um, one large component that contains everything in its cards. And then in this particular case, I think they used a template of page layout. So they just inserted all this large component into this one. Maybe we can even see. Um, so, okay, page moderation and P row. Um, it seems like it, yeah, it's replaced. I'm not really sure, like in this particular case, I'm not really sure, you know, why why this stage is created in their case. Um, but I see that this is a detached template of our um, of our page. So they just adjusted it and then inserted that one. So it's a very simple example, but it shows the basics how we work in the products together with the with the design systems. Well, I've got I've got a couple of questions on this one actually. Sure. So if you zoom back up to the, the components part of the file. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. into, into 
into this one or Sorry, the, the moderation settings file if yeah you sure bring back up to the, the components there so mm -hmm. it'd be great to get some at least your perspective i think i know the answer but why you think why you encourage people to create components in a local file instead of having these components in the system oh yeah so i cannot answer probably for all the teams but i had this specific conversation with some of them um, and what I learned is um, that, uh, you know, majority of the teams, they have design systems file in their project. I mean, just for their product, uh, which is irrelevant for global just assets and design system that I work with. Um, but usually they, they post a, and, and, and publish new components in, in there only when new features are published. And, and developed already. While in this file, it's usually the features that they're planning to be planning to develop. And it still it still doesn't exist. And it might change in the just in the middle of it. So what they do instead at the beginning, they they host all of their components locally for this file, means that this project, and then once this project is finished and the feature is published. So then they just copy paste it into their main uh, design system library. So it's, it's create components, ship the feature, move the components to the library. Right, yeah, exactly. Perfect. And on these components as well, they're, a, they're nested components. So it's, I guess we're looking at organism level structures here. How does mm -hmm. a designer know that it needs to be 24 pixel spacing in there? Uh, yeah, good question. So. We communicate this one through design guidelines. Design guidelines are just written documents which designers have to read, uh, read. So at the moment, like we rely on just trust and then professionalism. So just people know that, okay, we have six pixel grid just in our case, and then we use the spacing. Right. Um, I think trust is, is super important in all stages of product releasing and I think um, yeah. we can all learn a lot from that simple phrase is that that's true a lot of the time we we hesitate to trust that the developers will implement the right thing but as long as you're all on board as long as we have the documentation somewhere that somebody needs to be reading and um, I think we can all place that trust in our team and um, right. secondly to this one um, when it when it does come to the library handoff I guess process to you how is that communicated um could, could you repeat the question? Yeah, so this, this component, for example, let's say that ultimately it needs to be in the design system. Yeah. What's the process going from local file, local component, publishing, and then you need to implement it? Oh, oh yeah. So in this case, uh, we have a pipeline of our process that we have a dedicated um, request form where people can submit their product reviews. So usually like all these new feature requests, they occur from new product features. Um, so once they work on this, they submit through the form and then every morning we do the uh, just reviews, like whether we have new requests or not, if we have, so then we assign one of our team members just to meet with them and talk with them about their product. Maybe sometimes we can even suggest some alternatives that they don't even need the component. In some cases, once we understand, so we do um, in a contribution way, that means that a design system in our team, um, in, in our company acts more as an assistant and then the owner of all the effort needs to put, put in, including design and the development uh, is uh, responsibility of the product team, meaning that I'm assisting designers to define their uh, feature in this spec format as, as we have. Um, and so I usually do the reviews, introduce them, onboard them. And then once this is ready, so we have a common meeting with our developers and, and, and product developers together, we hand off the files. And then our developers do the same with their devs that we onboard on the API that on the whole uh, repository that we have, how they should work. They usually make a change, we QA it, approve it, and then only the documentation is uh, the part that we take only by ourselves and then Figma components as well. So we don't ask them to 
create special Figma components by them uh, because sometimes it's it's very um, uh, like we, we because we share the these components to over two hundred designers, so we want it to be top notch quality. Um, and then we have some standards. So at this moment, like it's faster for us to work at this way. So I can share briefly like how our design system library looks like in Figma. Um, like that'd be great. Uh, admit, yeah. Whilst we're whilst we're talking about sort of transitioning of components from files to files, how that linting process also works between the, the, even your design systems team and the, that sort of the, the code side of that, with regards to things like 24 pixels padding between things, is that a manual process that you go through? Um, yeah, I'd love to know a little bit more about that. Oh, um, you, you mean that um, if, if we defined uh, one spacing, but in the product, there is a different one. So how we act in this case, or? Or even when the, in the ideation phase of, the, let's take the moderation settings page, somebody doesn't abide by your six grid system, six pixel grid system, mm -hmm. you, when is that caught and how do you manage that? Hmm. Uh, or is everyone perfect and everybody always does the right thing? So, like, I, I must say, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't check on that of a low level. Usually when doing product reviews on the, on the spacing, like if it's generally seeing that something is off, so then of course I usually just try to react and then and, and leave a comment. Um, but in the most cases, even a if a designer makes something a little bit, not 100% correct as in production, our components exist. Developer can implement it, it in a higher quality than it was designed, just because like we have very um, defined API, which is means that we provide layout component with, which has default values. So in the most cases, developers just need to use default values. And then if they notice that if it, it doesn't match, in a designer's work, usually they escalate this, try to communicate, and then they understand that, oh, it was just an issue, you know, uh, human mistake. Um, but yeah, but if it's something uh, made intentionally, so yeah, in most of the cases, just people talk with our team and then try, we try to solve it together. Right. Hmm. Okay, so. I don't know. We hear a like few few examples of our uh, design system library of the components. So I think I will not go into the details how our components are built, just because today's topic is more about uh, the handoff and then collaborating with developers. Uh, but just briefly, yeah, because we try to combine and 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 reflect as much as possible the API level of the real component. Therefore, like it, it requires a lot of understanding about the real component as it's developed. And then also it requires a lot of understanding about how Figma works. And also what we just learned recently that, that it's very, very easy to run out of its memory <laughs> when working in this and, and, and managed way. So uh, yeah, taking all these, things into effect. So therefore, we are the owners right now of uh, uh, Figma, Figma assets. You know what, let's, uh, let's see more examples of uh, how different teams, they uh, hand off their work files to developers. So this is, um, a more complex uh, example I gathered. It's from a Promote team. They were working on a uh, email marketing uh, editor solution, which allowed to change the paddings of components. So how this team works, they, they have this template where they have this overview page at the beginning, then they define their flows. 
let's wait until it loads. Yeah. So yeah. And what I really like is that they, they even built this uh, template for themselves just to stack everything into these rows. And usually they take all these flows based by the case. If it's like happy path, um, some edge cases. In this case, it's just based per component because each component it has its own padding controls. Uh, so let me just scroll a bit about the contents, what is going on here. So this is a, an editor. Um, where a consumer can just drag and drop button to create a newsletter. And then once it's clicked uh, in the design section, there's this new control, which allows to set the paddings on the top, on the bottom left, right. Um, yeah. So all of this, uh, it has a content area as well. So, so they just copy paste the flow after their design work is finished. So they hand off this one for content writers so they can just read it and make it sure that it's a high quality text. So it can also be passed to localization team. Um, as I understand in their team, the, um, the writer prefers to even sometimes leave some sticky notes and add and until it's finalized. And, and then um, once the texts are finished, then this also once it's once more, it's copy pasted for dev specifications. And then it has few extra areas. So as you see, like at the bottom, there's the same flows that developer can just get familiar with it. And then at the top, they have um, this area, which is explaining just the exact area that a new layout that occurred, explaining the, what they actually need to develop in a, uh, in a visual way. Um, this, so, is done by, this is done by the designer on the project, not the design systems team, right? Exactly, yeah. Okay. Cool. And is this, uh, the stand, I know you said that lots of teams do it differently, but is this kind of thing the standard way of working as a product team? Yeah, many teams work like that. Um, and uh, a, a person who had, yeah, who I was supposed to, to run this, so actually they started this way as, as at least I learned because they used Figma for already for a couple of years at least. You know, so yeah, so, I know that he could tell a story how they came to this um, stage. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I cannot, but it seems like this is this framework really works because what they do here, they just write down all the relevant people that should be involved in this project. So for a developer, sometimes it's important to understand who they should approach um, if they have questions. Of course, every time and every team uh, in our company, we just, we don't send this by email. We usually schedule a 15 minute meeting just to go over it and then just make sure that nobody has any questions. Um, so this is, I think like, just because of this meeting, I think nobody missed these features that we learned during the usability test that the description and the URL exists here just because they, these questions were already answered in person. Um, yeah, and then they show even these stages. So in some cases, uh, yeah, I see that it, it has content. So it's important to know whether the content is done or not. So then sometimes if a content was adjusted, so a developer has to know about it. So this is why they use these um, tags. And, uh, and then some annotations are put, what's interesting that some annotations, they even share the links to the storybook. But does this require every designer to at least know Storybook exists and how to use it, how to navigate it? Yeah. Um, so what is happening here? I see. No, none of my stories work. Uh, <laughs> no, it's just that URL has been changed recently, and they are static links. So, right. um, so this is the downside. Um, we're working on it. And yeah, so. It, was supposed to lead to this component. Um, 
Really yeah, so the, the education of this, um, I guess the technical side of that. Do you host office hour sessions with the designers? Do you, do you have like an open avenue for communication? How, how do designers understand that that stepper component existed, for example? Mm -hmm. So yeah, what, what's interesting that if we, um, um, I need to open the file that I can edit, it would be this one. Let's just jump, I don't know, let's say to intro. If I go into assets, and if I go to Wix library, so all the families that we see here, um, icons, layout, lists, forms, actions, they all use the same structure as, uh, as this area. And then also if I drill into actions, I have this amount of buttons. If I go here inside of it, these are the same buttons. So for them, it's very easy to relate uh, because uh, we try to use the same language and then the, the exact same names, even if the names, they don't make sense, we still keep, keep up to them uh, because then it's easy to find. Um, and uh, yeah, and then usually they just, insert this component, they scroll a bit here, read a bit, and then just understand, you know, what they can control and whatnot. And also the button themselves, usually once we add them here, um, the properties that we communicate in, um, in these controls, we, tr we try as well to be the same, you know, and see, use the same naming as all these descriptions have. This is where you start to link back to that API that you were talking about before. Yeah, exactly. Great. Um, so with regards to that API, um, I know it's, it's quite a technical term, but it does relate very well to how you're structuring Figma components. Is that something you had to push quite hard for when you're thinking about this as an approach or is it just something that naturally landed at how you're going to work as a team? Um, I think it's an evolution. It's just at the beginning we had totally separated areas that developers, they had their own environment and designers, they had their own. And it caused a lot of frustration in between because nobody understood each other, you know, a lot of mistakes happening. And then, yeah, we understood that, okay, we need to collaborate on this, you know? So we're not expecting from designers to be developers and from designers to be, uh, I mean, opposite, <laughs> so, yeah. um, but we just want to care about, you know, that about each field that not to be ignorant, you know, um, and, uh, and also at the same level, like uh, I had the chance to have a conversation with Nathan Curtis, also about the same subject, like what, you know, should do in this case. And as we see example, in uh, Google, for example, they, they have separate areas in material design, um, but we have some other design systems as well that they use only one area. And it just, the reality is it's very hard to keep in sync when we have multiple locations. To synchronize and, and make a seamless pipeline, it's a hell of a job. So for us, it's it's way more efficient just to, sacrifice maybe a little bit of a, um, some things from developers that they have to see designer stuff that is relevant for them. And then designers have to see a little bit of a technical stuff in the same place, just because like it's all contained in the same place. But in the end, they both then speak in the same language. And for us, it's user maintenance. So it's, like we see benefit of it. And so far, nobody has been complaining. I've got a couple of questions in that I'd love to answer you, ask you from the audience. Um, the first one I'm gonna run in is questions from uh, Dermot, and they'd love to know what process or plugins you have for checking accessibility on your components. Oh, yeah. So accessibility is a, um, is a painful topic for us because we really care about it. We're working on it. We're not there yet. Um, it's just there is nothing to hide because you can, you know, test us. 
Um, yeah, so right, what right now, right now we, every new product and every new component we make, uh, we make them accessible. So once uh, teams develop their products, they make them accessible, whatever is on their level of responsibility. So what I say, what I mean, um, that if they make a product that uses our components and our components are inaccessible, they're not fixing that. We're just logging it. And then we have right now backlog of issues, uh, which we're aware of. And then we're prioritizing of fixing them. Um, but the whole process, how it, how it goes, we have a dedicated accessibility team um, where, where people um, just, they are professionals who usually review these products, including our components, and they just give our guidance, you know, how the, comp the whole product should behave. Um, so in a nutshell, what product teams, they have this dedicated area and every, uh, every our product you find in, in, in Figma, uh, they, they, they have this accessibility area where once they hand off the, the work files to developers, um, they show you know, what the tab index should be and if they have some landmarks, some specific zones that also that responds on this, so they show in here as well. This example, it just shows, you know, it's just a small feature that is, is not the whole product. Therefore, it touches only this area. But the, for the whole product, it would touch the landmarks of the, the whole um, interface. And then, yeah, it, it would have this definition. In our component accessibility, so I can give you a demo with the component that we recently improved. We call it a pokeover menu. Uh, technically, what it is, it's a list menu that appears once uh, some kind of a button is clicked. And then, um, as I explained, like we have all the structure in this spec template. Right below the constraints area, we have a few areas that are dedicated to accessibility. So the first one is a tab index. So this is kind of silly and, and simple, uh, just because like it's just one trigger action and then you know you focus on it. Um, but in some cases it, it has uh, many areas where you have to focus in. And then another area is uh, we show the keyboard controls. So a user would just a keyboard without using a screen reader, how that person controls it. Uh, so usually we show it in a simple flow that in this initial focus is here. Once you hit the enter, it opens and then you use up and down arrow keys. Uh, to navigate between it and then to close it as well, like we just specify that it's enter or escape closes. Um, so why we chose this way is uh, because designers, they're not developers and we don't expect them to show the DOM level explanation. Uh, what I mean DOM, so it's, it's a technical term, how HTML is written anyways. Um, so what we ask just to show the experience, like what the experience should be. Uh, so it shows the keyboard experience and also if we scroll down the screen reader control experience. So we just show that, okay, once you focus on this, screen reader will tell these words. And then, yeah. yeah that's awesome, thank you. <clears throat> the, the next question is in from Francis. And they'd love to know about the staffing that you have. So ratio of designers to developers, the, the amount, the size of the design systems team. Could you share some about that? Um, yeah, of course. So the ratio depends per team. Um, and each team has, I think it's own ratio, but in the most cases, it's uh, more, 
more developers uh, than designers in the team, uh, obviously. Um, I'm, I'm trying to make a number and, and not to make a lie. <laughs> so I'm sorry, struggling. We can, uh, we can maybe start with the design systems theme. If that's what you're yeah, saying. so yeah. In, uh, in, in design systems team, it's a little bit opposite just because we have a lot of uh, assistance work with a lot of teams um, and, and we have couple of hundred of designers. So, so our ratio in the past time, it was one of one. So it means that we have four developers and four designers. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's, it seems like it's a little bit unusual, uh, but we still find the work because a lot of our time, like we cannot dedicate 100% of our time to work on new features. We have spent half of our time assist different teams, and this is a, you know just how this uh, ratio changes. But in the most cases, there are like um, two developers, one designer. Um, in the most cases, as I know, or it can be slightly different. That maybe slightly more developers for one designer, or uh, if the need is similar to our team, so maybe increase is slightly larger. Thank you. We got a question in from Suraj about the padding rules that you have, um, and they they want to know about your padding rules. Are they in increments of eight or ten? Do you have any preference? I know you think you mentioned earlier about six, so it'd be great to get some insight into the decision around that. Yeah, um, so we use six pixel grid due to historical reasons. Like it's uh, it's very pricey to move from one grid system to another grid system, and it doesn't bring that much of value for us right now. So we're happy with it. Like, well, my personal opinion, four pixel grid, it, it is easier to use and, and better just because um, um, it's more flexible. Like you have more um, uh, steps to choose from, you know, it's uh, proportionally, you can make a nicer looking um, areas, but yeah, we stick, we stick only to, to these values. So in our case, it's six, 12, 18, uh 24 and so on um, in some very edgy cases we have to make excuses so like what we do we introduce a size of three so it means that we need something smaller than six so what we do we just make three pixel paddings from top and bottom and then the sum is still six so it falls nicely on the grid uh, the reason why we um, why we used to, you know, why we are strict onto this. It's easier for us to count, but also in the past, once we didn't have these sophisticated auto layout features, just to make sure that we're not off with the spacing, um, all of us used to use um, just a grid. And, you know, if you are not on the grid, so then you just see it and that, that something is not right. So then you just fix it. And this is why we always stick to this six pixel grid. Cool. And then the last question uh, is very important from Francesco is how much time do designers typically spend on documentation? Because it looks like there's a lot of documentation that happens in all stages of your design process from product to design system. Um, so we'd love to get some insights about the, the, the realisticness, I guess, of that. Yeah. Um, so it depends per component because the more complex, the more time it will take. But on average, uh, like we already, like we haven't documented all of the components, but over a hundred, we already did. So we know that on the average is around one day for a full documentation of a component, plus some development work because developers, they have their own roles, how to write snippets, for example. So if we go into this and, uh, you yeah, click to show code. So all of this is written by a developer and this is not a designer's work, obviously. And just to, they have their own rules how to make it very simple to show only what's important in here. So that takes additional time. I cannot give the exact number on that, but it's roughly one day for, for all of this, for a designer to write content and then additional time for the developer. Once only a feature change. So it's just, you know, 
small amount of time, just half a day, uh, maybe hour or two tops. Great, thank you. I think that's a really nice place to, to finish up effectively staking the claim for the importance of taking the time to spend on the documentation because in the long run, it will save you time, ultimately it'll save you money, give you better yeah. return on investment for your components. Thank you so much, Thomas. Thank you everybody for attending. I hope that was fun and we'll see you all next time. Thank you.